Welcome to Reading the Bible Together, and today we get a bit of a breather from the epic Noah story, and we find ourselves knee-deep in genealogy with Genesis chapter 10. Now, we're not completely done with Noah, as these genealogies focus on the descendants of his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth or rather Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Unusually, this genealogy starts with the youngest and then moves up to the oldest, kind of unique in the way that the Bible presents things. Remember, though, that Ham is the least popular of the three, having disgraced his father. In the same way that Judas Iscariot is always named last in the list of disciples, perhaps Ham was demoted from his natural standing and moved to the middle. Now, something this genealogy has in common with others in Genesis is the three sons formula. Adam, Lamech, Noah, and Terah all branch off into three major groups. But there are differences, too. With the big genealogy of chapter 5, we found it was very interested in the ages of the ancestors. But chapter 10 doesn't mention age once. What this chapter is interested in is not ages, but nations. Specifically, the nations which arose from the three sons of Noah. There's a couple of other things to notice too. Not every ancestor is given a list of descendants. Of Japheth's seven sons, for instance, we're given the list of only two. Much more important is the explanatory notes about the characteristics of each of the three main lines. Those notes tell us something important. Rather than strictly geographic, the genealogies are grouped according to social and cultural formats. What does this mean? Well, say you're doing a family tree of your own ancestral line. Some such trees might say, these are the parts of my family which moved to Atlantic Canada. This is the group that stayed in England. These other folks all ended up in the States. So that's a geographic genealogy. But a social cultural genealogy says something different. This is the part of my family that were farmers. This, this is a part of my family that ended up in, in cities, working in trade or in factories. Here's the group of my ancestors who were musical and so on. So combine these two styles, geographic and the social cultural style. And, and that's the kind of genealogy that you get here. So, looking at them socioculturally, we can see that the descendants of Shem are the nomads. The descendants, uh, they spread all over the place. The descendants of Ham are largely the sedentary farming folk, the agrarian folk of village and town, eventually even establishing cities. The, the descendants of Japheth are the maritime nations, the seafaring folk of the islands and the coastal areas. You take all of these and you put them together and you've really described the entire Mesopotamian and Eastern Mediterranean world in these outlines, both in terms of geography and in terms of trade and culture. What we for sure find out is that the sons of Noah are being obedient to the command of being fruitful and multiplying, as well as spreading out from their original base of operations. Now, this makes the next chapter, chapter 11, a bit puzzling. In the Tower of Babel story, we return to an era prior to these genealogies where there is but a single language and where everyone, rather than spreading out all over the place, has settled in Shinar. Now contrast this with verse 5 of chapter 10, which tells us that each tribe and clan had its own language and with the wide geographical swath described in the entire chapter. It seems as though chapter 10 and chapter 11 need to be reversed. However, it was deemed important to list the sons of Noah and their offspring immediately following the great Noah epic, and that, of course, makes sense. Now, another thing about this chapter is how, as a genealogy, it looks, it looks back upon history to compile its list. Some of the ethnic groups and cities mentioned in these geneal genealogies didn't arise until well after the events in all of Genesis, when uh, the Joseph story is at an end and Israel is, in, or the Hebrew people are in slavery in Egypt and so on. Well, history has a long lens and these genealogies do too. 
It's possible when reading the Bible, you tend to skip passages like this. Maybe you even skip this particular study. I don't blame you. These are names and faces unfamiliar, names and places unfamiliar to you. It's hard not to kind of glaze over when reading them, but, but go through the list again. Ask yourself what stands out to you, places, names. Note, for instance, how prominent Canaan is and the Canaanite clans, which are mentioned again and again, as they even are alluded to in the previous chapter. Remember, those are the peoples in the areas, the Canaanite clans and Canaan, which is going to feature most prominently in the remainder of the biblical account, because the land of Canaan becomes the land of Israel. The Canaanites are the people who the Hebrew people are going to have to defeat in places like Jericho in order to settle the land themselves. These ancestors and these ancestral lists will continue to speak as we continue to move through the Old Testament. But they've had their say for this time. Next time it is to Babel and the famous tower as we step back again in time with Genesis chapter 11. <laughs> we'll see you then.